morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be here. It's, has it warmed up outside any? Yeah. It's still cold? Yes. Well, warm weather is coming, I've been told. So uh, keep keep praying. And, and by the way, speaking of prayer, we have prayer cards, so always feel free if you have a, a request to fill those out. We have some announcements. Uh, on April 1st, there is a family Easter event that Pastor Brandy wants us to announce. It's, it will begin at 4.30. Uh, the Chamber Singers will have a concert here next Sunday, I believe at 3.30. Is that right? And uh, I also saw something else I want to bring up. Uh, out on the hospitality desk, there's uh, coupons at O'Charlie's to, uh, if you're hungry, you can help the youth group at the same time. So be sure to pick those up. And I believe you have some message for us. Pastor Flares, I think that O Charlie's night is tomorrow night, is Monday night, if I'm not mistaken. Is that what the, the flyer shows there? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so Monday night there for O Charlie's um, for the family uh, family mission. Okay. Uh, good morning, church. My name is Kevin Balo, and I am the chair of your leadership team uh, here at Boston City United Methodist Church. As you may already know, earlier this week a letter was sent to the members of our congregation um, about the responses that were collected uh, after last Sunday's presentations. Um, I was informed that while this letter did go out on Wednesday, I received it in my mailbox on Saturday. I know that some um, have not received theirs yet. Um, and so let me recap that here now. Uh, the results were as follows. 106 responses indicated that a church conference should not be called and that we should remain a United Methodist congregation. 96 responses indicated that the leadership team should request a conference, excuse me, a church conference for disaffiliation. So, 52.48, uh, 52 52.5% of, of responders indicated that desire to remain United Methodist, and that is precisely what we will do. Our exploration of disaffiliating from the United Methodist Church at this time is complete. So, we started this process together, and I pray, as does the entire leadership team, that we remain together as it concludes. As we heal any divisions that have been created or revealed through this process, it is important to move forward together as United Methodists by remembering Wesley's three rules of Methodism. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. So, allow me to leave you with a reading from the book of Isaiah. This is chapter 43, verses 1 and 2. It says, But now, this is what the Lord says, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, the flames will not set you ablaze. Friends, no matter what we walk through as individuals or as an entire congregation, a congregation that spans two campuses and six services, let us move forward together, knowing that God has summoned each of us by name, that he has redeemed every one of us, through His Son, Jesus Christ. Those are the truths that we can focus on as we proceed together. Pastor Dan. Pastor Brandy is uh, uh, out of town this weekend, so I'm preaching the two contemporary services for a change. That's why you have the privilege of having Pastor Clarence with you this morning. Uh, but I did want to make a couple of comments. Um, when I first come, came to you, um, I told the leadership team and I told you that my goal was to lead an honest and unbiased process as we considered uh, disaffiliation, a process that would discern your desires. 
I prayed that it could become, it could be done in a manner that honored God and displayed a Christ-like witness to our community. And that we would keep Purple Door Church moving forward. In the midst of our discussions, worship attendance has actually grown. Children and youth are being taught our faith. Community dinners have continued serving nearly 200 people each month. And the free store has continued its exceptional work. Churches across Ohio and across the country have literally been torn apart while considering disaffiliation. That tearing apart that tension in those congregations, I believe, has compromised their witness to Jesus Christ in their communities. We have completed our process in a way that many other churches would envy. There is news in these results upon which we can build. It is obvious that we have disagreement. But through the years, you have not let those disagreements harm your witness for Jesus. That's a tribute to the maturity of your faith and to the exceptional work of your leadership team over the past year. It's also a reason for hope into the future. You've learned to work together in spite of differences. That can continue. If you are disappointed with the results, don't give up on a church that you have loved and served for many years. I believe that's how Christ wants us to be a church. Not uniform, but united in our love of Him. I believe that's what John Wesley meant when he said, Though we may not think alike, may we not all love alike. You have lived that. Let it continue. My work with you now turns to making sure that I leave the next pastor the healthiest possible congregation. In the time I have left with you, I will be giving all of my efforts to that work. May God bless our work together. Let us now prepare to worship our God.
morning, church. Let us rise if you're able and uh, praise the Lord with song. Our opening hymn is number 188 in the hymnal, Christ is the World's Light. Your presence gives us light. 
O oh Lord, help us to hear you whisper to us, let not your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Lord, this morning we pray for all who are having difficult times, those who are sick, those who are hurting, those who are struggling, those who are grieving. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them, that you would comfort them and give them peace. Bless them, Lord. Bless your church. Bless us here in this congregation. Bless all the churches in our community and all the churches throughout the world. Lord, may your name be lifted up and praised and by your people around this world. Give us strength to follow you. Follow you. Give us courage to live for you. Give us your peace. And Lord, may your light shine upon us and change us and make us new. And may we grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. And let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, we will continue our worship by receiving the, off, the morning offering this is the way that we can participate in the work of the kingdom and may God bless this offering and use it for his glory. Would the ushers come forward?
creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. You have blessed us with much. Please take a portion of our blessings, take these gifts given joyfully to the glory of your kingdom here on earth. chapter 9, verses 1 through 42. May God bless the reading of his word. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was and others said no. He just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, Yes, I am the same one. They asked, Who healed you? What happened? He told them, The man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed it. Now I can see. Where is he now? They asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. 
Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him, he is old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should not get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this, I was blind and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man exclaimed, I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has ever been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. When Jesus had heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think that they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we're blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied. But you remain guilty because you claim you can see. May God bless the reading of his word. Oh, and we have a hymn to sing. That uh, you may remain seated here. We'll we'll sing beneath the cross of Jesus. No, we won't have a chance. Thank you, Janet. From page 585, this little light of mine, you may remain seated. <laughs>
my notes here, in my Bible. There it is. Okay, stay put here. I know that song from uh, Vacation Bible School, but it was a little bit different than what I learned. It's, yeah. it's still similar enough. I, I like it. I, I like the other one, too. But shine all over Rose City, right? So, okay, great. Well, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And this story is about him bringing light to a man who was born blind. All his life, this man was in darkness, and Jesus gave him his sight. Light and darkness. That's a theme in this Gospel of John. Uh, we see it throughout the pages. Light and darkness. The, the Gospel begins with, with this theme. Listen to these words from John 1. It begins, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And on down here, In Him, in the Word, was life. And that life was the light of mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And, and on further, just a few more verses we read. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. In Jesus we see the glory of God. He is the light of the world. And I remember years ago I experienced light and darkness in the way that made a real impact on me. I was in high school, and my science club, uh, we went to Mammoth Cave. Have you ever been to Mammoth Cave down in Kentucky? And uh, we, we went camping there. Oh, there weren't many of us. It was a small school, about five or six of us with Mr. Moorfield. Uh, we went camping and went to Mammoth Cave. I think it was my senior year. Um, uh, Dale Herbert and I had the, made the plans for our dinners. And uh, we, we, we fixed dinner. We grilled hamburgers for lunch. And we grilled hamburgers for supper. And we grilled hamburgers for breakfast. I think the next lunch was a box lunch underneath the ground in the cave. And for supper, Mr. Moorfield said, let's go to a restaurant. <laughs> and uh, I probably had a hamburger then, but I'm not sure. But uh, it, it was uh, quite an adventure going down into that cave. Uh, we were part of a group, uh, oh, maybe 15 or 20 people. Uh, we had a, 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 a tour guide to lead us through the, the cave. And I remember going down through the mouth and and the guide was telling us that, oh, you can see evidence that humans have been here, and Native Americans, and Kentuckians, settlers, and, and uh, apparently uh, there was saltpeter there they would mine. Is saltpeter used for gunpowder and stuff like that, uh, I think. And, and then on further on down, uh, there was the evidence for a human ceased, and we went on down into the cave. And the guide would turn on lights that were ahead and turn off lights behind and, and lead us. And we went on down through the, the cavern. There was narrow spots at times and it opened up to large rooms all under the, the ground, all under the earth. And, and we saw stalactites and stalagmites. I can't remember which is which. I should have looked it up. Uh, some were still active. Water was dripping. And those were still growing, and don't touch them, you'll stop the growth, we were warned. I remember that. <laughs> uh, and uh, he told us that this vast network of caves there in Kentucky was formed by water seeping through cracks in the limestone and dissolving the calcium carbonate away and forming these large caverns, and it was quite a sight. And then when, when, then when we were deep into the cave, he showed us something. Well, I don't know if the word show is the proper word. You see, he turned the lights out. It was dark. It was very dark. You couldn't see the, couldn't see the walls of the cavern. You couldn't see uh, the people who were part of the group around you. You couldn't see the tour guide. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And then your eyes started playing tricks on you. 
And after a short time, he struck a match, and there was light. And you could see that little light outshone all the darkness around us. And last night, as I, was, as I was trying to sleep, I was thinking about it. You know, today, that probably wouldn't work. Everybody has cell phones. They'd have their lights on. I don't know how those tour guys do it today. But back then, no cell phones. This is way back in the old days. Uh, and uh, it was dark, and I learned it. And, and then it has come to me, an old gospel hymn I learned in church, when we sang from the Sunday School hymnals. It goes, The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, his glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light, it is shining for thee, sweetly the light has shined upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see, the light of the world is Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, he, he proclaimed this in chapter 6, right before the passage we read this morning. Listen to his words. He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And, and then here in the next chapter, beginning the story, he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Uh, we heard this story read to us just a short time ago. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were walking along and they saw a man who was born blind. And, and here we see the light coming to this man. Uh, the disciples ask him, whose fault was it? Why was this man blind? Uh, they ask him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Who sinned? Uh, the common idea, the common belief then was that someone had to have sinned for this kind of suffering to occur. Uh, was it the man himself who sinned? Was it his parents? Why was he born blind? Oh, a common time uh, then was that the rabbis taught that some could sin before they were born, and they deserved this blindness. Some, many believed that in ancestral sin, that parents could have sinned and caused this to occur to their children. It was their fault. Whose fault is it? Who sinned that this poor man, blind, was blind? And Jesus answered them and said, Neither, he says, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. It, was, it wasn't anyone's fault, but through this situation, the glory of God would be shown. Now in the Gospel of John, these miracles that Jesus did are called signs. They are signs of the glory and power working through Jesus. And here, these, the disciples and others were, were about to see the glory of God at work. Um, we've heard the story. Jesus made some mud. He spit into the dust and made mud, and he put that on the man's eyes. Uh, now, to me, this sounds a little bit disgusting, doesn't it? <laughs> Using spit. But I was reading various uh, scholars and commentaries saying, oh, this was considered an agent of healing in, in that time. There are healing properties in this. Uh, well, I, in fact, I wrote down so I get the words right, put on my uh, highlight. Uh, 
It was a common belief that saliva was curative, especially for diseased eyes. And then another Bible scholar, someone I really uh, uh, recommend, he said it was an agent of healing in popular thought, but it was still disgusting. I kind of agree with that. <laughs> anyway, Jesus did it. And he put this mud on the man's eyes and then said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man obeyed. He went, washed his eyes, and he could see. Sight was restored. He had been blind all this life in darkness, and now the light has dawned upon him. Now, that was noticed. <laughs> that drew attention. He was a beggar. People knew who he was. They knew that he had been blind. And now he was seeing, how could this be? And, and so the people wondered, is it really him or maybe it's someone who looks like him? And the man said, it's me, I'm the one. I was blind, now I can see. The man Jesus healed me. That drew attention. They took him to the Pharisees. Now note, this occurred on the Sabbath. Uh, you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. And also note, uh, the religious leaders were not too happy with Jesus anyway. <laughs> so that goes into the whole story. Well, they brought him to the religious leaders, and they asked him, what happened? How is it that you're seeing? And he gave them the story. This man, Jesus, made mud, put on my eyes, and I went and washed as he told me to do, and now I can see Jesus healed me. Oh, that caused a division amongst that circle of religious leaders, the experts. He said, how can this be? Some said, it can't be. A, a Jesus broke the law. He healed on the Sabbath. This cannot be of God. But others said, oh, how could a sinner do such a miracle like this and, and restore sight to a man born blind? So they were divided. And then they thought, well, maybe the man wasn't blind in the first place, so they had to explore that. They called his parents. His parents were brought to them, and they said, yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind, he's not able to see, and no, we don't know why he now sees. He's old enough, you ask him. You see, they were afraid of those religious authorities, because they knew that they'd been warned that anyone who acknowledged Jesus would be thrown out of the synagogue, removed from the worshiping people of God. They were afraid. The, the, the leaders then called the man again, asked him, how is it that you can see? We know this man who supposedly did this. He's a sinner. How could he see him? And the man said, do you want to hear the story again? <laughs> I told you, uh, he's a prophet. Uh, I was blind. Now I can see. And I don't know about it, but I know that, that sinners can't do this. Well, turn the page. He said, nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Uh, to this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. They removed him from the worshiping community, the people of God. The story doesn't end. Jesus was seeking for him, and Jesus found him, and Jesus asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man believed in Jesus, the Messiah. He worshipped him. He had been touched by Jesus and restored to his physical sight, and now he believed in Jesus and was given 
spiritual sight. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. It is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has shined over me. Once I was blind, but now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. Years ago, I experienced light and darkness in that cave there in Kentucky. It was quite impressive. It still is with me. I, I realized that if we didn't have any light down there, if the lights had not come on, we would have been lost. We've been isolated down there under the earth. We would have got separated from one another. We couldn't see each other. We would not have found our way out. We would be stumbling, separated. But Jesus, but, but because of the light, we came to see each other. Because of the light, we could see our guide in the path that we were to follow. Because of the light, we could get out of that cave. And in life, Jesus is our light. He is our guide. And he will lead us. And, to, and we can see all others who are following him, following the light. I remember reading in 1 John. Let me turn to it. Again, this theme of light and darkness. And John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. We come to the light of Jesus, and when we are in his light, we have fellowship with all other believers in Jesus. And as I was thinking, here is true unity. Our unity is in Jesus. It doesn't matter what church you go to, what building we're part of. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> but I know there's other churches uh, and other uh, buildings that people are worshiping, and they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. It doesn't matter which denomination and, and all these things. It, that what's important is that we come to Jesus, the light of the world, and when we are in him, we have fellowship with one another. We become part of the family of God. Well, the other day at Silver Sneakers, uh, I was talking to a good Baptist lady, and we talk about church things, and, and it, we have good fellowship <laughs> Uh, before we start marching in place and listening to the instructor, uh, and I shared with her that I believe that here in Rose City there's one church, and in Columbus there's one church. Now we worship in different buildings, we are part and active in different congregations, but together we make up one church. We're on the same team, we're on the same side, we're proclaiming Christ. We have come to the light, and he has touched our lives. We are one church. This is our true unity. We're one in Jesus. In his light, we see the way. In his light, we see our brothers and sisters. And we have fellowship. We live in a dark world. There's a lot going on that is not good. We see people who are stumbling, who are hurting, who are blind. There is bitterness, there is prejudice, there is greed, confusion. That list can go on and on. There is dark in the darkness. And without, and in that darkness, there is no hope. But Jesus is the light of the world. And he's able to heal our blindness and give us sight. But we must turn to him and trust in him and believe in him. He invites us to come to him. Come to the light that is shining for thee. Sweetly the light has shined upon me. 
Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. And let us pray. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the light of the world. You have come to us. You invite us to you. Oh, Lord, may we believe in you. May your light shine upon us. And may we see clearly. And may we love one another. We ask this in your name. Please rise if you're able, and we will sing our closing hymn, number 378, Amazing Grace, verses 1 through 4. Present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. God bless you all.